Um, we have biomarkers that can measure all of these processes. So for the focal little lesion, we pick up it on MRI, uh, usually on a, what we call T2 scan, we pick up a white blob. And if it's acute, we can pick up blood brain brain damage using gadolinium, a contrast agent. Um, we pick up the gradual worsening of the condition, the end organ damage I refer to, using brain volume uh, and other, other metrics for volume loss. Uh, and we also can pick up soluble um, markers now. There are quite a few inflammatory markers that you can measure using panels of cytokines, for example, and, uh, in the spinal fluid. And when you damage axons and neurons, you release their contents, and we pick, it, we pick that up using a uh, neurofilament level. So we have quite a lot of ways of monitoring this uh, disease process. So how do we uh, treat multiple sclerosis? So to treat MS, there are two, two approaches. We have so-called disease-modifying treatments. So these are treatments targets, targeting the inflammatory pathogenesis of this disease. And then we have treatments to treat the consequences, the symptoms uh, of the problems that arise. Uh, and now there are a large number of treatments, um, and they've emerged over the last 25 years. Uh, we started off with so-called immunomodulatory therapies, that was interferon beta and latirum acetate, uh, and these probably had pleiotropic effects and weren't associated with much immune suppression, but they weren't that effective. And then we moved on to a, a generation of oral immunosuppressive therapies, and we've now moved on to some very targeted uh, biological mainly monoclonal antibodies, um, and these categories have just got more and more effective uh, with time. So we've got quite a lot of choice now. <laughs> um, how do we use these treatments? So I like to think about treatment strategies. So most of the therapies are, are so-called maintenance treatments. They're given continuously, and when you stop them, the MS comes back. So it doesn't really alter the underlying immunopathology. We then have uh, induction treatments. Um, so induction is when you give a, a potent, usually a chemotherapeutic type agent that depletes the immune system, and then you put them on an immunomodulatory treatment afterwards to keep the disease in remission. That's not used much. It's most commonly used in France where they would use something like matoxantra and a chemotherapy agent to deplete the immune system, and they would continue it with interferon beta or glutarum acetate. Um, a much more common treatment now is so-called immune reconstitution therapies. So these are treatments that are given as short courses and deplete the immune system, allow it to reconstitute. They're usually given as two cycles, and the two licensed treatments is alemtuzumab, that hits anti-CD52 uh, marker on leukocytes, and the other one is uh, cladribine, um, in the same bracket as mitoxantran and HACT. The important thing is these um, treatments are not given continuously. So when the immune system comes back, it's competent and can fight infections and respond to vaccines. And hopefully the disease goes into long-term remission. And what's probably going to come out in the future is going to be a combination uh, uh, approach where you will be using, say, maybe two different agents, maybe lower doses than you're previously using to try and optimize the clinical effectiveness um, without causing too many adverse events. And there are some trials at the moment, for example, with a, uh, a sphingosine 1-phosphate modulator in combination with a drug called dimethyl fumarate, which is an immune modulator. So this will be an evolving uh, space, the combination uh, treatments. I like to classify these drugs into two big classes, the so-called maintenance escalation. So these tend to be either immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive, and you'd escalate uh, you know, as you fail to respond to one class, you go to a new class, compared to the immune reconstitution therapies, and there are, uh, there are two categories. There's the so-called selective ones that just target, for example, B cells. We have a drug called ocrelizumab, which targets anti-CD20, and it's a B cell depleter. Some of us are beginning to use it, or some people begin to use it as an immune reconstitution therapy. They don't give it continuously, where, where it's licensed to be given continuously. Uh, and then there's the non-selective ones like alemtuzumab, mitoxantra, and HSCT that just you know, deplete the whole immune system and allow it to recover. When the immune system comes back, um, it often doesn't come back in the same way it, would, it did before. For example, the repertoires of T cells and B cells are different. Um, and so I think people have got to understand that immune reconstitution um, simply refers to that when the immune system is reconstituted, it's competent in terms of fighting infections and responding to vaccines and for tumor surveillance. But the adaptive arms, the T and B cells, are not necessarily the same. And I think that's the message to get across 
is that when we use these treatments, we're trying to change the uh, repertoire long term. Um, how do we use these treatments? Well, it's patient choice. Uh, I don't think there's anything specific uh, to guide this. You know, some people like maintenance escalation because it's uh, less risky. Some people prefer um, immune reconstitution therapies because it gets at the heart of the pathogenesis. Uh, and I think you just have to profile individual patients and take personal factors into account when uh, deciding about these strategies. There are differences between the two. Um, you know, immune reconstitution therapies are irreversible. Um, so once you've had them, you can't reverse them, which some people don't like. Um, the risk is also front-loaded. It's much higher when the immune system is depleted, whereas the maintenance therapies, the risk accumulates with time, particularly if they're immunosuppressive. Uh, you get immunosuppressive complications with time. And I think that's the big debate we're having uh, at the moment is between the maintenance or continuous immunosuppressive drugs versus the immune reconstitution therapies and short-term immunosuppression. Uh, um, and, I mean, when you start discussing the consequences of long-term immunosuppression, a lot of patients are now electing to be treated with immune reconstitution therapies rather than uh, the continuous ones. Another factor that differentiates them is safety in pregnancy. You know, this disease affects young people. Uh, there's more women that get it than men, and obviously if you want to start or extend a family, you don't really want to be on a maintenance treatment because of some of these drugs are associated with um, teratogenic effects, for example. So this is where the uh, immune reconstitution therapies are more favorable because they're in and out of the system quite quickly. The disease hopefully is in remission and you can fall pregnant uh, safely without having the drug on board.